Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this MPTEL course entitled Transcendent Fiction where we're looking at Virginia Woolf's short story uh, Solid Objects. So we have already had one lecture on this text and we'll just carry on from where we left last time. So as I mentioned in my previous lecture that this particular short story can be very uh, interestingly interpreted using um, thing theory or what we more commonly call as MET or material engagement theory in terms of how humans engage with materials and how the affective engagement with material uh, in a way it creates new kind of relationships uh, sometimes in the form of fetishes, sometimes in the form of obsessions, sometimes in the form of uh, uh, some psychotic situations. But this particular story as I mentioned is slightly Kafkaesque in quality, it has an irrational narrative and the irrationality of uh, the principal character over here. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, John, who is the collector over here, the collector of broken objects, solid objects. The irrationality is obviously undercutting uh, the rational, pragmatic, uh, masculinist narrative of political progress, uh, social status, etc. So, at the beginning, we find, uh, as I mentioned in my previous lecture, at the beginning, we find a very long cinematic shot of the two characters walking in together. And uh, they almost become like, they almost emerge, they almost appear as one dot, one little speck in a vast uh, wilderness of the sea uh, and the sand. Uh, but uh, increasingly as the camera moves closer or pans closer, we find that uh, the, the physiognomy features of the characters are revealed in slow motion close-ups. And then what it does essentially and visually is that it maps out the two characters. Uh, so one uh, in a way deviates uh, from the mainstream masculinist uh, progressive narrative of political ambition etc. and then ends up being uh, an irrational a collector of solid objects where the other remains uh, in the mainstream narrative and the divergence is important for us to uh, sort of map. But interestingly uh, we also talked about and we will return to this topic later in the story uh, this entire human obsession with objects or with materials uh, and like I mentioned this, this particular short story can be very interestingly mapped uh, with material engagement theory or MET as we call it. And, uh, there are lots of in interesting books that you can read on the subject and I'm happy to recommend a few uh, in the online portal that we have. Uh, but you know, if you look at the entire discourse of material engagement theory or thing theory, we find that uh, you know, it sort of complicates the relationship between humans and things, right? Because in a one, on the one hand, it looks at objects as something which can only be consumed by humans and how their significance, social significance, semantic significance, cultural significance is entirely reliant. Uh, on human engagement. But there is also the other spectrum of thing theory which says that you know things can appear as non-objects uh, or objects of non-use or sometimes post-use, right? So they have exhausted the usability, they have exhausted their entire uh, you know, currency uh, of use uh, and they are just there as abandoned things. So the whole idea of being abandoned uh, are situated uh, temporarily at least, post utility, a post value, a post purpose is what makes thing theory interesting because you know, that is a gaze, that is an interpretation that is taken and mapped uh, onto things uh, as something which is outside uh, the human radar, the human ken of consumption. Now in this story obviously we find that most of the objects that Charles is keen on picking up uh, are things in that sense. I mean, these are objects which have uh, exhausted their value, exhausted the utility, exhausted the pragmatic purpose. Uh, so the whole post-purpose quality of these objects is what makes them interestingly uh, very, very bare, naked, uh, pure things. Uh, so in that sense, the human engagement with things over here is very, very pure uh, because uh, Charles is picking up things over here uh, not in terms of the utility they can give to him but purely in terms of the fetish value, purely in terms of the uh, you know, the entire obsession uh, quotient that he has or has established uh, with those things which is outside uh, the consumption quotient uh, of mainstream uh, uh, mainstream masculinity. Because you find that this these objects which he picks up from various parts of London uh, have zero use value, they have zero currency in terms of usability, uh, functionality, uh, you know even as a decorative symbol they are completely useless and that is the whole point. The uselessness of the objects is what makes them purely things. Uh, so if you read uh, a theory such as Bill Brown for instance where he talks about how 
an object only becomes a thing when it becomes post function or post purpose a post value right so in that sense uh, this story is about post value uh, and you know the story ends obviously with uh, the narrative that Charles has given up on his political career uh, he's completely uh, destroyed his political ambitions as destroyed as any political promise that he had so in a sense he becomes a thing as well right so he becomes a post value uh, entity a post purpose entity so the whole idea of purposelessness uh, becomes a temporal category something which had a purpose before is not exhausted of its purpose uh, and we see that even in a longer fiction of world life, for instance in Mrs. Jalloway when we see Septimus Smith as at once masculinist brave soldier who comes back from the war uh, but now is completely exhausted his functionality is completely exhausted as heroism and he's just there as some kind of a uh, incongruous uh, irritant uh, in the otherwise uh, functional metropolis. Uh, so, his suicide in the end in a way is like a, a complete commentary on his uh, non-thinking end of his incongruity uh, in this entire functional metropolis. So, among other things this particular short story uh, solid objects is about uh, incongruity is about irrationality and is about fetish formation and how that fetish formation undercuts uh, the consumption quotient which is otherwise operative in mainstream masculinist narratives. Right. So, uh, um, and now we come back to the story and we find how uh, this, uh, you know, John over here uh, becomes obsessed with objects and how that becomes, uh, you know, a detriment, a quote unquote detriment to his political promises, to his political career. So, whether uh, this should be on the screen now, whether this thought or not was in John's mind, the lump of glass had its place upon the mantelpiece. Uh, where it stood heavy upon a little pile of bills and letters and served not only as an excellent paperweight but also as a natural stopping place for the young man's eyes when they wandered from his book. So, uh, notice how when the, the lump of glass is first taken inside the house, uh, it seems to have or at least it appears to have superficially uh, some use value as uh, some kind of a paperweight thing and uh, lots of papers and letters uh, because obviously he is uh, someone in a political arena so he gets invitations he gets all kinds of letters from different lines of people so that lump of glass becomes initially a paperweight so it has some kind of a in, in a way it's a parody of usability in a way it's a parody of use value that is exhibited over here okay uh, looked at again and again half consciously by a mind thinking of something else any object mixes itself so profoundly with the stuff of thought that it loses its actual form and recomposes itself a little differently in an ideal shape which haunts the brain when we least expect it, right. So, again look at the engagement between the human brain and the objects over here and you know the whole idea of uh, uh, engagement over here is complex because on the one hand the human engagement with objects is uh, quote unquote abstract engagement, abstract affective engagement, you are looking at an object in a way that shapes your mind and also as a dialogue a process in a way your way of thinking your imagination shapes the object or reshapes the object right. So, the entire shaping reshaping uh, it takes place through a very complex combination of abstraction and materiality. So, on the one hand we have this abstract thought processes uh, that is conferred uh, on the object but on the other hand we have this object as a material tangible presence. So, we have this uh, constant complex combination of abstraction and materiality with which this uh, you know this entire engagement uh, uh, works uh, or proceeds right. So, uh, John found himself attracted to the windows of curiosity shops when he was out walking uh, merely because he saw something which reminded him of a lump of glass. So, notice from this point in the story how John becomes almost very, very voyeuristic. Uh, so, anywhere he sees an object, anywhere he goes out for shopping, uh, whenever he comes, comes by a window he finds himself attracted uh, to little objects which reminds him uh, of this original object which he picked up from the sea show. Right. So, in a say in a way we can see the beginning of fetish formation over here, how his engagement with materials, how his engagement with solid objects uh, begins to reshape his mind, reshape his, his imagination and in a way it, it, it diverts or deviates away from the mainstream narrative of consumption and progress which he had set off himself initially as a political person. So, um, anything as long as it was an object of some kind uh, more or less round perhaps with a dying flame deep sunk in its mass anything china glass 
amber, rock, marble, even a smooth oval or egg of a prehistoric bird would do. So, again look at the way in which uh, the entire fetish formation that he has is beginning to take place because anything he sees uh, connects him uh, to the, uh, the lump of glass he had picked up, right. So, the lump of glass becomes something like an archetype in his mind, the archetype of the solid object and everything else around him uh, serves as reminders uh, to the archetype uh, in a way in, in, in terms of how it can connect uh, to the original archetype which is what he picked up from that uh, beach. He took also in keeping with his, his in keeping his eyes upon on the ground, especially in the neighborhood of wasteland. Uh, this is where it begins to get really interesting because in the whole idea of waste becomes uh, you know discursive in quality and we we'll look at that in great details. Uh, in the neighborhood of wasteland where the house will refuse is thrown away. Such objects often occur there, thrown away of no use to anybody, shapeless, discarded, right. So, again this is exactly what I meant when I said this is the whole idea of abundant object or abundant projects and we see uh, among the many things abundant in the story is his own political career which gets abandoned in the end, right. So, he, he just gives up his political career uh, and the whole idea of giving up on objects uh, again that this becomes in a way discursively speaking post function, a post use, a post value, right. So, uh, and Gregory Kennedy has got a, a very interesting uh, book called The Ontology of Trash. Uh, those of us who are interested in trash studies or waste studies, uh, that is one of those go to books that you can look at. Uh, so, Kennedy's book is interesting because it talks about how what we classify as trash, what, it, what we classify as waste is always almost always um, uh, a state of post consumption. So, there is a temporal category about trash formation, something only becomes trash only after it is consumed and exhausted of its consumption quotient, right. So, the whole idea of having consumed something, having exhausted the use value of something, having liquidated something in terms of its functionality is what makes that object into a trash or into a waste product, right. So, the the space away, the wasteland away becomes a very symbolic space because you know this is where he begins to haunt, this is where he begins to go over and over again in the hope of picking up something which will you know feed his fetish uh, for picking up solid objects. Uh, so, you know he goes to this neighborhood of wasteland where the house of refuse is thrown away. So, again if you take a look at his speciality over here it becomes a very symbolic space. So, he is someone initially in the story is someone who is uh, uh, his promise is tipped to be uh, big in politics, so he's got a lot of political promise and he's supposed to be uh, someone who's uh, inhabiting the mainstream space of political progress. Now, he finds himself completely you know, deviated from that and he finds himself in a wasteland essentially where he's out there to pick up trash because inside trash amidst all the trash and garbage uh, and rubbish that is uh, heaped and piled away up, he is looking for objects which will form his fetish, uh, which will feed his fetish in that sense, right. So, we can see how the fetish formation over here uh, is often at odds with the entire idea of usability, ok, of the quotient, the consumption quotient. So, shapeless, discarded, refuse which are thrown away is where in those sites which are uh, he is exhibiting over and over again. So, in a few months he had collected uh, 4 or 5 specimens uh, that took their place upon the mantelpiece. Uh, they were useful too for a man who is standing for parliament upon the brink of a brilliant career who has any number of papers uh, to keep in order, addresses to constituents, declaration of policy, appeals for subscriptions, invitations to dinner and so on. So, we can see how uh, there is a parody which is being formed over here because you know is uh, the narrator is saying that oh, these are very valuable objects. Why? Because you know these can be used as paperweights uh, for all the other valuable objects which are there, which are invitations for dinners, uh, declarations of policies for any man who is uh, really aiming to make it big in parliament uh, collecting solid objects across uh, tr trash and wasteland is very, very helpful because they can use those paperweights. Now, obviously, uh, the tone is very, very parodic over here. But it's also it's darker than parody because what is being said over here, we're having two different kinds of narratives at work. So one is the narrative of usability, functionality, prestige, etc., and the other narrative is obviously one of waste, one of trash, etc. But the point is, the interesting bit is he, the character over here, he finds himself more fascinated uh, with trash, with solid objects which otherwise have no use value, which otherwise have no functionality, right? So you have two different kinds of narratives of consumption at odds with each other and that is exactly the point. So, we have this irrational fetish which is also uh, uh, a form of consumption that is beginning to undercut uh, the more mainstream uh, narrative of consumption which is about parliament papers, declaration policies uh, and uh, appeals for subscriptions, invitations etc. So, we have two different kinds of two different orders of objects at odds with each other very symbolically situated mapped onto each other and the fact that 
the trash objects are situated on top of the uh, quote unquote functional objects is obviously quite symbolic in quality because what that means directly and immediately is that those are going to replace in terms of significance in Jones mind uh, the quote unquote usable or useful objects right. So, what we see over here is entire ontology of usefulness or utility or value is beginning to get inverted and that is what I mean when I say this has a Kafkaesque carnivalesque quality this particular story. Okay, and now we come to more dramatic situations where he is actually absolutely obsessed in terms of uh, possessing objects, in terms of you know just going for the object which is uh, you know out of his ken, out of his reach. And obviously, it is quite symbolic in quality because when he is reaching out for these objects, it is not just a physical movement, it is also a social movement because you know for a gentleman like him uh, on the brink of a brilliant uh, uh, political career uh, to actually go to a trash land, to go to a rubbish heap uh, is basically a step out, a deviance uh, uh, um, uh, from his mainstream narrative, mainstream spaces which he is supposed to inhabit as a promising a parliamentarian. So, this is a situation where he finds himself. One day starting from his rooms in the temple which is where the baristas go in London uh, to catch a train in order to address his constituents, his eyes rested upon a remarkable object lying half hidden in one of those little borders of grass which edge the, the basis of vast legal buildings. Now, this is interesting because we find that uh, the main, the most important thing about a sentence is the liminality, the in betweenness. Uh, uh, look at the way in which there are so many orders of in betweenness over here. So, A, we are told that he is starting to go to uh, a place where to address his constituents. He is a, is a promising uh, parliamentarian and he is leaving from the temple to catch a train. The temple, obviously, is the uh, place where the uh, English, the British barristers go, uh, the barristers go there, right. So, uh, and his eyes uh, found themselves uh, looking at a remarkable object lying half hidden. Again, the translucence is important over here, half hidden. It is somewhere between opaque and transparent, right. It is not entirely known, it is not entirely um, and, uh, revealing uh, itself as what it is, right. So, the translucence is exactly what is, um, you know, at play over here, which makes the entire uh, the cognition uh, very, very, very complex in quality. Now, where is it half hidden? In one of those. Uh, little borders of grass which edge the basis of vast legal buildings. So, this is fascinating because when we have the legal buildings which are the objective architecture of law, order, rationality etcetera, but where do you find these objects? You find these objects in a grass between the buildings. Now, uh, again the whole idea of grass is important because uh, you know it seems to be it seems to suggest there is a bit of a wild growth. Uh, around um, the otherwise legal manicured buildings. So, the manicured legal architecture is the objective architecture of law, precision, order, rationality etcetera, but where we find these objects are not exactly in those buildings, but uh, on the area around it which is more liminal in quality, more anarchic in quality, more uh, wild in quality, more, less manicured in quality and that is why he finds uh, those objects uh, when he is heading out to address his constituents. He can only touch it with a uh, with the point of his stick to the railings and again this is getting very very symbolic because his stick which is otherwise a very gentlemanly uh, uh, extension of his personality is beginning to become something else now and we will see that in a moment. Uh, the stick uh, through the railings, but he could see that it was a piece of chenna uh, on the most remarkable shape. So, the chenna wire over here is exactly the object. So, it is a glass object, it is a half broken object and he wants to pick it, but he is trying to use it uh, prod it with a stick. Okay, as nearly resembling a starfish as anything shaped or broken accidentally into five irregular but unmistakable points, right. So, again, look at the, the irregular irregularity over here. So, this is what to say, this is uh, you know, to say that this is there is a method in madness in John because he sees there are five irregular points in which the object has been broken, but then in a way the, the brokenness can be quantified. So, the quantifiability of brokenness is, is important over here and obviously, he is getting more and more fascinated in this fetishist way uh, to look at the object and to uh, grip it, to consume it. The colouring was mainly blue, but green stripes or spots of some kind overlaid the blue. So, again look at the hodgepodge of colours, the, the confusion of colours and lines of crimson gave with the richness and lustre of the most attractive kind. John was determined to, to possess it, but the more he pushed the further it receded. So, you know he is trying to push for it, he is trying to get the object, but then it is moving further and further away. Uh, at length he was first to go back to his rooms and improvise a wire ring attached to the end of the stick with which by dint of great care and skill he finally drew the piece of chinna within the reach of his hand. So, the chinna wire which was broken has now reached his hands. Now, let us take 
a little bit of time and, and, and unpack the whole uh, objects over here. The most important object at play over here is definitely the stick. Now, what is initially the walking stick, which is a very gentlemanly flaneur uh, uh, instrument, is now increasingly becoming the rack picker's instrument. Uh, he's attaching some wire to the end of the stick just so he can pull an object and possess it. Now, that transition, the very symbolic sartorial transition from a gentleman flaneur to a, a, a rack picker, a, a waste collector, is exactly what we should be looking at in the story because that's what happens symbolically in the story because he was headed to be, he was tipped to be the next big thing in the parliament, the British parliament and he was a gentleman at the beginning, he was obviously very wealthy, privileged, comes from a cultural background, groomed to be a politician in the British parliament and now suddenly he finds himself as a rack picker. So his transition from the Flaneur in the metropolis, the leisurely, the leisure gentleman who is obviously very well and privileged to being a rack picker in the metropolis is exactly what is happening over here. And that symbolic shift is something we should, it's very visually and graphically described and hinted at by Wolf as this. Uh, we can see throughout the story is very, very visual. The visual grammar, the visual graphic details is very, very important for us to understand. Uh, so he sees the object. So as he seized hold of it, he exclaimed in triumph. At that moment, the clock struck. It was out of question that he should keep his appointment. The meeting was held without him. But how had the piece of china been broken into this remarkable shape? A careful examination put it beyond doubt that about a star shape was accidental, which made it all the more strange and it seemed unlikely uh, that there should be another such in existence. Right. So again, look at the very uh, flippant way in which uh, the misappointment is described away here. So the clock struck, he looked at the clock and then realized he missed his appointment and the meeting was held without him. Right? So obviously this absence becomes important and um, on one hand he's absent from the mainstream space of consumption and he's becoming a private consumer. Uh, from again this, this conversion from a flaneur to a rack picker becomes important, uh, even a level of social prestige cushion attached to the same uh, respectively. Right? So he finds himself as a rack picker now uh, with this string Y attached to the end of the stick and instead of uh, remembering or reminiscing about his misappointment, he is actually reflecting on the shape of this particular object and he was realizing how this shape came into being, uh, you know, how this particular chinoware uh, got this very strange shape. Uh, and he realizes that the star shape that he's holding in the moment is accidental because uh, it must have fallen from somewhere and hence uh, this particular object becomes unique. Now this is a key point over here. So the uniqueness of the object is exactly in its brokenness. Uh, so we have this interesting equation between uniqueness and brokenness in this particular story. So broken objects or solid objects which are half solid, semi solid, half broken, half shaped, uh, they are the unique objects over here. So again we go back to the original narrative that we have been pushing for a bit that the entire idea of consumption over here is undercutting uh, the dominant hegemonic order of consumption, the hegemonic order of aesthetics. So he is actually inventing a new aesthetic order, John, and he is a consumer of this aesthetic order in that sense. So the consumption over here of that particular unique uh, perverse aesthetic order in a way is undercutting uh, the mainstream uh, predominant and hegemonic aesthetic order which is deviating away from and which is obviously symbolically caricatured by its shift from being a gentleman for newer to being a, a rack picker with a, a Y attached to a stick. Okay, uh, so it is unlikely that another such object should be in existence. Set at the opposite end of the mantelpiece on the lump of glass that had been dug from the sand, it looked like a creature from another world freakish and fantastic as a harlequin. Now this is exactly uh, what we should be looking at at some point because there is an element of uncanny about his possession and by uncanny I uh, uh, use the un word uncanny in a very Freudian sense as unheimlich, uh, something which is outside the home, uh, unhomely, outside the home, outside the domestic uh, dimension. Uh, and the fact that it's bringing in the uncanny objects inside his uh, drawing room and museumizing them. So his drawing room becomes a museum of exotic broken objects and that actually undercuts the entire idea of order over here, the entire existence, entire narrative of order. So on the one hand of the mantelpiece we have this first object which I picked up from the scene show and now on the other end of the spectrum we have this object which I picked up from our railway station or maybe from our, uh, rails uh, you know, between uh, some very, very shrubs, uh, wild shrubs across uh, legal buildings. It's picked up another object using uh, the, the, the walking stake tied to a wire ring. 
right? So it's freakish and fantastic. The two words are interesting: freakish, bizarre, irrational, strange, uncanny, and fantastic. Something which out lies outside the ordinary. So it's extraordinary in a fantastic sense, a literally fantastic sense, as a harlequin. So the word harlequin is important. It's someone who does, does a pantomime performance, uh, sometimes comical, sometimes sinister, sometimes a, com a combination of sinister and comical. But in a way that further accentuates the carnivalesque quality in the story, right? So it seemed to be periodic through space, winking light like a fitful star. The contrast between the chinna as so vivid and alert and a glass so mute and contemplative fascinated him. And wondering and amazed, he asked himself how the two came to exist in the same world, let alone to stand upon the same narrow strip of marble in the same room. The question remained unanswered. So I stop at this point today because I just go back and unpack this a little bit because what he's exhibiting, what he's consuming over here is uncanny. So he becomes a consumer of uncanny, a consumer of strangeness. An entire strangeness is something is building, the entire architecture has been built by him, which is obviously undercutting the more mainstream architecture, the more household architecture of the mantelpiece. So the mantelpiece becomes just a platform, a very passive platform which becomes a reservoir of the uncanny, a container of the uncanny and you can see that how initially uh, the, these objects were used uh, to, as paperweights for more quote unquote useful materials but now the entire idea of usefulness and uselessness gets inverted which makes the story very very cunning values and quality in, in, in the sense that the most important, the most notionally important object becomes the least important object whereas the least important object becomes the most important object in this inverted imagination that John is exhibiting. And so in a way as I mentioned, uh, this story may be read and should be read among other things, among other interpretations as a very complex commentary and in a way a critique uh, of the consumption and modernity where you consume everything uh, as a use value, you consume everything with use value, functional value, etc. So John over here becomes a different kind of consumer, an alternative consumer uh, who consumes everything because of brokenness and like I said a little while ago, uh, the brokenness and the, 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 the uniqueness are equated with each other in this very, very strange story and we continue with this uh, equation and how it affects the human imagination in the next lectures to come. So I'll stop at this point today and I'll see you in the next lectures with the same text. Thank you for your attention.